Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Samantha Pettigrew, a member of the ICCT communications team. Thank you for attending today's webinar. The webinar is being recorded, and we will send out the recording to all participants sometime next week. Everyone has their microphones on mute. If you have questions, you can write them in the questions box in the questions box on the control panel to the right hand side of your screen. Uh, after the presentation, we will have a few minutes to answer questions from the audience. Today, we're going to be talking about decarbonization, uh, the path to decarbonization, the European passenger car market from 2021 to 2035, presented by Peter Mock. Peter is the EU Managing Director and Regional Lead at the ICCT. Peter. Thank you very much, Samantha. So I'll go ahead with my presentation. And today, I want to provide you with a key summary results from two papers that we recently published. On the left-hand side, the one that we published back in April, it was about scenarios for how the European Union could achieve CO2 reductions in the, in the road vehicle sector and how it would be possible to meet the targets of the European Green Deal. And on the right-hand side, you see a white paper that we just published yesterday. It is complementary. It's the same scenarios that we're looking at, but we're now focusing on individual technologies to meet the targets and we look at what are the costs and the benefits uh, of each of those pathways. I should say that the left paper is in general covering passenger cars, light commercial vehicles and trucks. The right paper that we just published yesterday is on passenger cars and we're currently working on similar papers for light commercial vehicles and then also later on, on heavy duty trucks. You can find both papers on our website. Um, there's a lot of data, of course, and I will present you only some high level results today. So if you want to go into the details and take a closer look, you should do so by going to the website and take a look at the, at the two papers. So um, first of all, for both papers, uh, as I said, we have defined scenarios and it's good that we first of all discuss so that I show you how those scenarios are defined. They are summarized in this graph and this is only for passenger cars now. And for passenger cars, uh, what you can see is that we have four scenarios. We have what we call the adopted policy scenarios. That is the one that um, is in line with the current regulations. So for passenger cars, that is a minus 15% CO2 de reduction for new cars by 2025. And for 2030, by minus 37.5%, both um, in relation to 2021 as a baseline. For that adopted policy scenario, we assume that there will be no further action beyond the current policies. So from 2030 onwards, CO2 emissions of new cars do not decrease any further. And then we have three alternative scenarios, which we call lower, moderate, and higher ambition scenario. And the difference between those scenarios is the, the end date, basically when we assume pretty much a full phase out of combustion engine vehicles, 100% CO2 reduction. And that is happening in the higher ambition scenario already in 2030, the moderate ambition scenario in 2035, and for the lower ambition scenario in 2040. And then you can see the kind of interim targets, which would be in the case of the, um, for the 2030 targets, it would be going from minus 37.5% to 50%, 70%, or even 100% CO2 reduction. So those are the scenarios that you should keep in mind for yeah, all the scenarios that I, I will talk about in the next minutes. First, going to the study that we published back in April, which was looking at uh, what are the overall emission reductions that are achievable in each of those scenarios. And the results are summarized in this one graph. So you can, again, recognize the four different scenarios. And what you see here are the tailpipe CO2 emissions of um, the road transport sector. So this covers uh, trucks, light commercial vehicles, and passenger cars. And what you can see is that, um, yeah, in the different scenarios, we achieve different CO2 reductions. And if we go to 2050, first of all, on the right-hand side, you can see that uh, in the adopted policy scenarios, we'll be far away from any necessary CO2 reductions by 2050. And then in the low ambition scenario, we achieve minus 79%, which is still not enough to be in line with the Green Deal targets. And only the moderate ambition and the high ambition scenario are kind of in line with the Green uh, Deal target, which is minus 90% for the road transport sector by 2050. So the key conclusion here is that uh, if we want to be in line with the Green Deal targets, we have to um, reduce new CO2 emissions uh, strongly enough to be in line with the moderate ambition scenario or the high ambition scenario. The second message is for 2030, in none of the scenarios, we can actually meet the, um, the, 
economy-wide uh, reduction target for, for 2030. Uh, in all of those scenarios, uh, the road transport sector would be far away from contributing to that uh, economy-wide target. So, in other words, it's kind of too late for 2030 already, but if we want to um, be successful for 2050, we should um, reduce emissions in line with moderate and high ambition scenario definitions. So that's the, the general reduction pathway. So now moving to the technology assessment that we published yesterday. In that paper, we look at different technology packages or vehicle types and, and their technology packages. And in this slide, I want to show you very briefly the CO2 emission assumptions that we have for the different technologies. On the left-hand side, you can see that we have uh, defined internal combustion engine vehicles and, and um, packages for those vehicles. Um, I need to stress that here we only look at gasoline vehicles. We do not consider diesel vehicles in the assessment simply because the, the market shares are decreasing so quickly and many manufacturers have announced that they are not going to further develop diesel engines for the passenger cars anymore. So we focused on gasolines and we include improvements in powertrain and we include improvements in road load and road load means weight reduction, better aerodynamics, better tires. And with all of these packages, it's possible to further decrease CO2 emissions from internal combustion engine vehicles. The, the theoretical potential um, is about 10%, or BCS, about 10% for the powertrain improvements in, from 2020 as a baseline going to 2025 or 2030. And then we further see an improvement for the road load um, potential of around 0.9% per year. Um, so it, it adds up and you can definitely still reduce CO2 emissions from, from internal combustion engines, um, but it's, it's not a drastic drop, it's more like an incremental drop in CO2 emissions. The next step would be moving from internal combustion engines as they currently are the conventional ones to mild hybrid vehicles, so the MHEV vehicles mentioned here. That offers another about 9% CO2 reduction. Um, and then of course you could move to a full hybrid theoretically and then further to a plug-in hybrid vehicle where we assume different electric ranges and then to a battery electric vehicle with also different electric ranges. We assume for the battery electric vehicle the minimum uh, range is 350 kilometers and then going up uh, depending on the configuration. I should also mention here that for our study we always focus on a compact car vehicle so typically in Europe that is the Volkswagen Golf type of vehicle which is the most popular one and all our assessments are for that specific kind of vehicle because we know from previous studies that this reflects very well the average European passenger car. I should also stress that of course we are in this study only looking at the type of pool emissions, so the official emissions according to the WTP procedure. Uh, we're not looking at real world driving emissions because the CO2 regulation for passenger cars is also just about WTP emissions. Um, in the last row, you also see that we took into account fuel cell vehicles. So we've looked at this in one of the um, alternative scenarios that I will show you later on, but it's not part of our main scenario assessments. So this is the CO2 reduction potential. And then of course, we also need to look at the costs. And here we have two different type of perspectives. So in the kind of background of the slide, you see the direct manufacturing cost increase. So this would be the additional investment needed per vehicle to uh, get those technologies that I just mentioned into the vehicle. And then more in the foreground, what you can see is the retail price increase, which in addition to the direct manufacturing costs also includes um, things like uh, development, um, research, warranty, and also profits for dealers and manufacturers. And uh, if we focus just on the retail price increase, what you can see is that uh, each of those technology packages introduced increases the investments and thereby also the vehicle price uh, for the vehicles. In the case of the internal combustion engine vehicles that would be compared to a 2018 baseline vehicle would be for example uh, for road load improvements an additional invest or additional repair price of uh, in the beginning 200 euros going up to something like 800 euros. Um, then the mild hybrids are more expensive about uh, 600 700 euros more expensive than the conventional combustion engine vehicles and so are the, the full hybrids and the plug-in hybrid vehicles. What I want to highlight here is the retail price decrease that we expect for battery electric vehicles, which is quite strong, as you can see. So if you focus on a battery electric vehicle, 350 kilometers range one in 2021, we still uh, assume that that sort of vehicle would cost around 10,000 euros more than a conventional combustion engine vehicle for 2018. However, that price uh, this additional price drops pretty quickly 
and in our assessment goes down to about 500 euros by 2035. Part of this is because of the battery costs that go down over time, and part of it is also because of the indirect costs, um, which we assume to go down significantly, uh, which means that yeah, the research development costs, the warranty costs for battery electric vehicles we assume to be um, significantly lower in the future than they are today. In comparison, the plug-in hybrid vehicle costs, as you can see, they are initially lower than the battery um, price increase, but then over time also decrease much less, so that um, yeah, rather, with some years into the future, the battery electric vehicles become cheaper than the plug-in hybrid vehicles. All of this data that we take is um, from literature, um, and a very important data source for us have been the data from our previous assessments carried out by the engineering provider FEV, and also um, other data that was more recently published by the engineering services provider AVL, um, which we also value highly in terms of their, their skills and knowledge about vehicle technology. So a lot of the data is actually based on, on that sort of literature data. I move on to the scenario. So after we define the technologies, the cost and the CO2 potential, uh, we then define the technology penetration for each of those scenarios. You see them, um, you see them here. And what you can see is that in comparison to the adopted policy scenario where the combustion engine vehicles remain in the market at high levels also in future years, in all of the other scenarios, the conventional combustion engine vehicles are completely phased out. Um, and are partially replaced by mild hybrid vehicles uh, for some time. Um, but in all scenarios, we also see that the battery electric vehicles ultimately penetrate the market and uh, yeah, depending on the on the assumptions, contribute to, to most of the vehicle market share already by 2030. You can also see that uh, depending on the scenario, the plug-in hybrid vehicles uh, are phased out pretty quickly. That's the case in the moderate and high ambition scenario. In the lower ambition scenario, the plug-in hybrid vehicles remain in the market until 2035, although in relatively small market shares. After we have defined the scenarios, what we can do is we can calculate the average compliance cost for each of the scenarios. And compliance cost means uh, what is the investment required per vehicle in order to reduce the emissions um, as we have foreseen in, in each of those scenarios. And the summary you can see here in this graph. So this is essentially sort of a cost curve um, for the different scenarios. The kind of until 2030, the cost curves look pretty much what we are used to from previous assessments. So the cost initially go, go up, meaning that if you want to decrease your CO2 emissions from the vehicles, you have to invest into better technologies. And that increases the initial investment cost of the vehicle. From 2030 onwards, though, the cost decrease, and that is different than in previous assessments where the costs ultimately always went up. Now we're seeing again a decrease after 2030, which has a lot to do with the battery cost reductions that we expect and also the reduction in indirect costs that we assume for electric vehicles. So after 2030, it becomes cheaper again. And you can see for 2035, uh, what are the cost estimates um, or the required uh, direct manufacturing costs uh, additional to the 2021 baseline vehicle. We do not only look at the direct uh, investment cost, but we also take a look at what are the benefits for consumers and for the society as a whole. For consumers, we take into account what are the fuel cost savings for consumers over um, an eight year time period. <clears throat> and um, for the society perspective, we also take into account um, avoided external costs um, for CO2. For this, we assume a CO2 cost of 180 euros per ton, which is in line with assessments for, from, for example, the German Environmental Agency. I should also mention that um, we, for the fuel cost savings, we are assuming that um, the fuel cost, the gasoline costs, will remain constant compared to the to the gasoline costs today. And for electricity, we assume 21 cents per kilowatt hour, which is pretty much the average electricity price for a private consumer in Europe at the moment. So we also assume that the electricity prices will remain constant. And for hydrogen vehicles that comes later, for fuel cell vehicles, we uh, expect actually a quite significant drop in the current hydrogen price in line with what are, I think, optimistic assumptions by the, by the fuel industry, hydrogen industry. And so, Taking all of this into account, what you can see in this summary table is uh, the different scenarios for 2025, 2030, and 20, 2035. 
and you see in blue, the blue bars are the additional manufacturing costs. That's what you've just seen on the previous slide. Um, so those go up. The more CO2 you want to reduce, the more you have to invest into the vehicle. But then if you go to the consumer perspective, you see the payback period. So um, when the additional investment pays back to the consumer and then the net consumer savings uh, over an eight years holding period. And what those figures tell you that is that, uh, yes, you have to invest first into the vehicle. You have to put better technologies into the vehicle that makes the vehicle more expensive. But then consumers also save significantly on fuel costs. And um, yeah, over time, over an eight-year period, then most of the scenarios have a significant cost reduction compared to the situation today. And interestingly, that cost um, savings for the consumers is pretty much... Um, related to the CO2 reductions. So the more CO2 you do, you reduce in the scenarios, the better it's also for the consumer, the more consumers can actually save in terms of um, running costs or total cost of ownership, and the more beneficial the scenario is for the consumer. And the same is true for the societal perspective. So if you also take into account the external savings um, of CO2, you see that the more the CO2 emissions are reduced, the better it is for the society as a whole, the more the benefits are. So overall, a very positive result, I would say, a very positive message that uh, if we can accomplish to reduce CO2 emissions significantly and quickly, that is actually also to the benefit of the consumers and society as a whole. Then, so those were the main scenarios, the four main scenarios. We also looked at two sensitivity analysis. And one, the one on the left-hand side here is one where we assumed that plug-in hybrid vehicles will remain in the market to a large extent uh, and battery electric vehicles will remain yeah, at a lower market share or will not achieve as high as market shares in the other scenarios and we also assume in that scenario that um, synthetic fuels e-fuels will be introduced um, to help uh, basically reduce emissions first and, and the idea is that um, you would, instead of relying on, on battery electric vehicle and full electrification, you would try to reduce the fuel consumption of conventional vehicles as much as possible by making them plug-in hybrid vehicles. And then you would try to substitute as much of the remaining fuel by using synthetic e-fuel. On the right-hand side, that scenario is a fuel cell scenario. So here we assume, well, until 2030, it's essentially the same scenario as um, the moderate emission scenario in the, in the main scenarios. But from 2030 onwards, we assume that fuel cell vehicles will be available and uh, will penetrate the market to some extent and provide a significant market share. And if we then look at the cost curves again for those two scenarios and compare that to the main moderate ambition scenario and also the adopted policy scenario, what you can see immediately is that um, the cost for the plug-in hybrid e-fuel scenario is much higher. It's more than twice as high as the standard moderate ambition scenario. So that pathway proves to be very, very expensive, partially because of the plug-in hybrid vehicles. As I showed a little bit earlier, the cost reduction for the plug-in hybrid vehicles we expect to be a lot less than for the battery electric vehicles, and partially because of also because of the e-fuels, because um, according to our assessments, they turn out to be a very expensive solution and expensive fuel. Um, yeah, that basically increases the compliance cost here. In comparison, the fuel cell scenario, the moderate ambition fuel cell scenario is still more expensive than the moderate ambition scenario, but it's not drastically more expensive. And I should also mention that the, the uncertainties are very high. So we are assuming here that fuel cell vehicles will be produced um, at a magnitude of around 0.5 million vehicles or fuel cells by 2030. If that is really happening, then we expect the cost to come down to such an extent that yeah, the scenario becomes feasible and not that much more expensive than the moderate ambition scenario. However, there's a big if. I mean, if we will see that production volume by 2030, this will happen. But at the moment, yeah, it doesn't look from the manufacturer announcements. There are hardly any, any strong manufacturer announcements for producing fuel cell vehicles in large numbers for the passenger vehicle sector. Then this chart is maybe also interesting, uh, again, showing the different retail prices for the yeah, for the different vehicle types over time and um, what i want to highlight is that maybe starting with that brown line you can see that the that the mild hybrid vehicle type uh, and the conventional uh, combustion engine vehicle uh, types they will increase in cost so they will become more expensive over time because of more technologies being added for example also exhaust emission um, technologies being added to be compliant with future exhaust emission standards 
And then in green, you can see how the electric vehicle costs are going down. And uh, the top part is the plug-in hybrid vehicles. You can see how those costs um, or the, the additional retail price for the plug-in hybrid vehicles also decreases over time. But um, yeah, much more that is for the battery electric vehicles. So you can see how the two lines, plug-in hybrid vehicles batteries, cross in around 2023, 2024. So that's the time when battery electric vehicles will become cheaper than plug-in hybrid vehicles. And then in the future, battery electric vehicles will also become cheaper than conventional vehicles, mild hybrid vehicles by around 2028, 2029, US estimate in study. That's from a technology perspective or from a retail price perspective. From a consumer perspective, the picture um, looks like this. So here it's a bit complex graph, but basically you see the total cost of ownership um, from a consumer perspective for the different years and for the different vehicle types. And if you just focus on the battery electric vehicle 350 kilometers range, um, that vehicle starts with an additional price of around 7,000 euros. So that vehicle is about 7,000 euros more than a conventional gasoline vehicle in 2021 and requires um, incentives from the government to be price competitive. But then in 2025, this changes already by 2025, that vehicle has about the same cost as a conventional vehicle, doesn't really require any incentive anymore to be concept competitive. And then in the future years, 2030, 2035, that battery electric vehicle will be significantly cheaper than a conventional vehicle. And then that brings me to my last slide. So the um, you might say that the market shares for battery electric vehicles or electric vehicles that we're assuming in the scenarios seem high for 2030. Um, but first of all, what I want to emphasize here is they are necessary to meet the climate protection targets that we have in place. They are also, from a price and cost perspective, definitely feasible, as I tried to explain to you. So the cost benefit ratio looks very good. And then thirdly, and this I want to show with this slide here, um, it is quite in line with manufacturers announcing. So with this chart, I'm trying to illustrate the different manufacturers announcement at the moment. The size of the blocks represents the market size of each of those manufacturer groups. And you can see in the different colors uh, how much of a market share those manufacturers have announced for the future. And maybe most prominently, Volkswagen Group, the largest company, sees 60% battery electric vehicles by 2030 or electric vehicles by 2030. Um, so just to highlight again that manufacturers, I think, are already preparing for that sort of scenario with increased market shares of electric vehicles and increased CO2 reduction. That's it from my side. Again, the note that you can find all those studies on our website, the two papers that I, I focused on here, and then um, also additional blog posts, one on interim targets and the importance of interim targets, one on the alternative fuels crediting idea. If you're interested, take a look. And if you have any further questions, ask now in the, in the webinar or always feel free to approach me later by email or call me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Uh, again, if you guys have questions, go ahead and write them in the questions block on the right-hand side of your panel. It looks like we've already had a couple come in. Um, I will start with a short one. Did you assume any purchase and this incentives on BEVs in cost scenarios? No. So those scenarios that we, or for all the analysis that we looked at, um, those are all without any incentives. So we just look at what is the additional manufacturing cost? What has the manufacturer in, to invest into the vehicle? And then also later when we took a look at the consumer perspective, what are the benefits in terms of fuel cost savings? Uh, what are the costs for electricity on the other hand for the recharging? Um, but we do not consider any incentives. So our analysis is, is meant to inform policymakers um, what are the kind of true costs and benefits for each of those technologies. And then policymakers have to decide uh, if they want to provide any incentives for any technologies and, and what the amount of those incentives are. But that's a separate topic. It's not part of that study. Okay. And what about comparing not only with e-fuels, but also renewable fuels such as biomethane? This technology compares very well in terms of carbon abatement cost with BEVs, for instance, and is very complementary. Yeah. The... Well, so one issue with the fuels is that um, we have considered them, but the, the potential for those fuels is very limited. Um, so we expect even with a very high uh, incentive for e-fuels that would be paid for by the manufacturers and in the end by the consumer through a cutting system, even assuming high incentives, we do not see a high potential um, for, for actually substituting the, the, the amount of fuel required. And that's also 
part of the reason why we say if e fuels then only in combination with plug-in hybrid vehicles because you first of all have to reduce fuel consumption as much as possible and on the on the gas side i would say it's the same issue maybe even even worse because um, also there the potential is i think very limited and uh, investment required for the technologies of the vehicles is is also significant is is, is pretty high and the the co2 reduction that you would achieve by combining that gas vehicle technology and the and the renewable gas that is suggested by this question is not very high so if you compare that benefit that you could get to the benefit of electrification of using a battery electric vehicle where you can reduce tailpipe emissions by 100 percent and you compare the cost benefit ratio that cost benefit ratio looks a lot better for battery electric vehicles so in other words we didn't consider that gas vehicle concept uh, cost competitive and we have not included it in any of the scenarios for that reason okay thank you uh, the next question is asking as the cheaper BEV hasn't materialized so far, despite falling battery prices, what makes you think that it will materialize in the future? Also, car manufacturers will not want the product they sell to become cheaper either. Well, I, number one, I think it's not really true that electric vehicles haven't become cheaper. Um, I would say, um, maybe the purchase price has not has not gone down but the the level of comfort that those vehicles offer has gone up significantly so now you get a, a much higher battery a much higher range than you maybe did a, a few years ago and manufacturers you could say that manufacturers have invested into a better performance of those vehicles instead of reducing the price for the future and the yeah, and the other aspect is that at the moment there are purchase incentives in place. So there have been stories about manufacturers adapting to those purchase incentives and um, pricing their vehicles in such a way that they optimize the profits um, that they can get in, in a country where an incentive is, is in place. For the future, I would expect that this is going to change because in the future, those purchase price incentives will go away for sure. Governments will at some point stop funding those incentives. And... Um, that means in order to, to stay price competitive, manufacturers have to reduce the, the price of those vehicles and they have to really directly compete with each other. And so I'm, I'm very sure that in the future there will be a highly competitive market for those electric vehicles. And it will be very important for manufacturers not only to provide um, high performance vehicles or good performance vehicles, but also vehicles that are as, as low in price as possible. So I think the market will change. It will be a much more normal market than it is today. Uh, where it's quite protected at the moment, I think. And so I think that issue will go away over time. Okay, thank you, Peter. We'll do a couple more questions. There's one that's asking about the transport environment. Recently published a Bloomberg NEF study showing cost parity between ICE and BEV as early as 2026. Is What is the difference to your study? There's almost no difference. I mean, it's a completely different study with a different methodology and everything. But interestingly, the results are essentially the same. So, um, yeah, the TNE study, I think, is showing price and parity by around 2026. Um, in the graph that I showed you, I see price parity in our study around 2028. So that's like a two years difference, which is not much considering all the, the uncertainties with the inputs and so on. Essentially, it's the same results. I would the same result. I would say that by by 2025, uh, total cost of ownership parity is already there from a consumer perspective. And a few years later, whether it's two years later, one, two, three years later, um, there will be also price um, cost compare, price, price compa compare, no, how do you say? It? Well, the, the price will be the same for, for a better electric vehicle and a conventional vehicle um, without any subsidies. It's essentially the same result. Okay. Uh, now I've got a question about SUVs. It says, so based on your analysis, we could say that by 2025, subsidies could be diminished. Did you take into account any changes in the size of vehicles? Currently, the trend is that they are getting much bigger, like SUVs, but in the future, the reverse trend would be reasonable considering needs. And the person mentions that nobody needs so big vehicles as SUVs. The, me being in the US, I know they're very popular here, not so much in Europe. <laughs> Well, they're becoming popular in Europe and elsewhere in the world, actually, too. Um, it's a yeah, it's a good issue. Um, the, um, we've thought about this, of course, but um, we've done the same as in previous studies. 
we assume for all of our studies that the market composition will remain the same, um, meaning that we want to assess how can the current fleet be yeah, decarbonized and what would be the costs and the benefits of that. Um, we do not want to, with that sort of study, we do not want to assess um, how could the cost be reduced by changing the vehicle market. For example, everyone just buying small vehicles that would also help to reduce CO2 emissions. That's not the, the aim of the study. And uh, same way also, if people buy more SUVs and emissions would increase, how would that affect the cost is also not something that we want to look at. Because if we would find that there's additional cost because people would buy more SUVs in the future, vehicles would get more heavier and so on, uh, it would increase the cost. Um, but it's actually not something that should be mixed with the regulatory discussions that we have at the moment because the regulatory discussions are about how can we reduce emissions from, from the current fleet and what should policymakers do, what would be the cost for this. Um, but it is true. I mean, in the past, the trend has always been that vehicles became larger, heavier, and, and had more performance, and this did not help in reducing CO2 emissions. Um, it's true if this trend continues in the future, it will make it more difficult for us to reduce CO2 emissions, will make it more expensive for us to reduce CO2 emissions. And um, yeah, I, I share that concern, and I think policymakers should also look into this issue, but it's it's not part of the study, and it's typically also not so much part of our focus at ICCT. Okay, um, a little bit related question here is asking, do you think that the fleet in Europe needs to shrink and how many vehicles are sustainable and possible to meet with the CO2 targets? Yeah, it goes in the same direction. This is, um, so yeah, I mean, you have different ways of reducing CO2. We are focusing here only on the technology side. So with the vehicles in place, what can you do to make those vehicles more efficient, have less emissions? Um, what you could, of course, also look into is, uh, can we replace vehicles? Can we take them off the road and so on? Can people move differently? Um, those are all valid questions, but it's not focus of ICCT's work and definitely not of this study. Okay. Um, maybe we have time for one or two more questions. Will you expand your study to include a well-to-wheel analysis? Uh, yes, we have a study in, in the pipeline, which is not only about well to wheel, but actually life cycle uh, analysis, life cycle assessment for different vehicle types, comparing them. Um, so that is coming up and it will be, I think, a very interesting study focused on passenger cars and not just in Europe, but also in other regions around the world, uh, comparing different technologies and showing, yeah, which of the technologies make sense also from a life cycle assessment um, that's coming up uh, in I don't want to get, give an estimate, but in, in the next couple of months, and that will complement the study. So it's, yeah, you can see them a bit in a row. So the first study that we published was more on the uh, transport scenarios overall. This one now is specifically on vehicle, on, on passenger vehicle technologies. And then there's more studies coming up on the, on the life cycle assessment point of perspective and also about light commercial vehicles. Okay, I'll do the last question here, um, I guess related to the well to wheel question. Someone is wondering if we engage on work that has to do with infrastructure and other supporting policy instruments other than just purchase subsidies. Yes, that is part of our work and there's other studies on this issue, but it's maybe a good, good question to summarize um, what I think is the key result of the study that we published now. And that study, in my opinion, is a very clear analysis that shows the technologies in principle are ready. So we need to reduce CO2 emissions quickly and urgently and significantly. The technology for this is there, it's basically available and the cost benefits look positive. So from a technology cost perspective, it's not a problem, I would say. It's of course a challenge, but it's accomplishable. Um, what I think are challenges, could be challenges, is the infrastructure side. So how do we, build up quickly enough all that recharging infrastructure that we need for the electric vehicles. And then secondly, also, how do we manage as a society this transition? So what does it mean for our workforce? How quickly can we re-educate um, workers in the factories and so on and so forth? I think those are two very important aspects that we haven't taken account for the study. There's other studies on this, other organizations also working on this. And um, in my opinion, those two issues may be maybe are the key ones to decide on how quickly we can transform and how quickly we can decarbonize. Um, it's important to think all of this together and to work on all these issues, but at least on the technology cost side, I think we can, with that study, again, show that this is 
not such a hurdle as people might think very often. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. I know we have a, a couple more questions that we didn't get to, uh, but you guys can see on the screen Peter's contact information. If you have any more questions that you'd like for him to answer for you, feel free to reach out via Twitter or his email, and you can always look at our website for our full range of studies. Uh, thank you, everyone, again, for coming, and we hope to see you at our next webinar.